I'm John Bowden from Rock History Canada. As most of you know, we lost the great Miles Goodwin December 3rd. He was 75 years old. One of the founding members of the band April Wine. Throughout their history, he was the main source of the music, the lead singer for most of the time. The band started in the late 60s with Miles Goodwin and three members of the Henman family, Jim Henman on bass, Dave Henman on guitar, and Richie Henman on drums. That was the Fast Train era going into On Record, which featured their first U.S. hit, You Could Have Been a Lady. Bassist Jim Henman was gone, replaced by Jim Clench, who would become a major part of that band up until the end of Standback. Then came Electric Jewels. During the recording, the Henman brothers were gone. Gary Moffat joined the band. Then came arguably their best album as far as studio albums, 1975 and Standback. Virtually every song on that album was heard across Canada. Ooh, What a Night by Jim Clench. Miles Goodwin's Tonight is a Wonderful Time to Fall in Love. Who Could Forget Don't Push Me Around. Come Hear the Band, I Wouldn't Want to Lose Your Love. Near the end of 1976, Jim Clench was gone, replaced by Steve Lang, and The Whole World's Going Crazy was their next album, featuring the title song and Like a Lover, Like a Song. What should have been a Miles Goodwin solo album, Forever For Now, followed with You Won't Dance With Me, which we'll talk about in this series. Live at the Elmo Combo, when they were opening for the Stones at that famous venue in Toronto. First glance was the making of the classic real lineup of April Wine. Brian Greenway joined the band. Three guitars, Miles Goodwin, Gary Moffat, Brian Greenway. And their next U.S. hit, Roller. From Harder Faster, there was Say Hello and I Like to Rock. But then the big album. 1981 and Nature of the Beast, Just Between You and Me, their third U.S. hit. But really, there wasn't a bad track off Nature of the Beast. Again, the classic lineup of April Wine, Jerry Mercer on drums, Miles Goodwin, chief songwriter, lead vocalist, Brian Greenway on guitar, Gary Moffat on guitar, and Steve Lang as bassist. You want to hear April Wine rock, crash, and burn. Power played followed. There was a few other albums. And by 1986, April Wine was no more. We're going to talk about the breakup of the band in this clip from 1988 as Miles Goodwin was promoting his first solo album. It's an interesting clip. He says some biting things about the end of April Wine. And since we lost him a few days ago, we thought it'd be appropriate to present this interview. Steve Burgess does this interview. He's a writer. He was a guy who taught me how to run the board at 96 k in Edmonton in 1983. He also became one of my best friends. And one day he just called me and said, would you like my interviews? And I'm very proud that he's let me put these on YouTube. They had 16 studio albums, 34 singles, 16 hits in Canada in the 70s, 6 in the 80s. That's 22 Canadian hits. From March 29th, 1988, Steve Burgess interviewing in studio Miles Goodwin on Rock History Canada. Gee, let's ask, uh, let's start off by asking the question that you've probably only heard, let's see, three cities today. You must have heard it nine <laughs> times. But uh, why pick this time to uh, go solo as opposed to. Now, I had heard, by the way, that the last album was almost uh, came out as a Miles Goodwin solo album. No, no, no. 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 It had nothing to do with it. The last album for April Wine, mm-hmm. right? was a contractual album. I They had to have one more album. There was no more April Wine. We'd broken up. Mm-hmm. I wasn't living in Nassau. I just moved there. Uh, brought in a producer, some guys from Montreal. We did an April Wine album without April Wine. Uh, I tried to make it sort of sound like an April Wine album without the group. Mm-hmm. But that, no intention of doing a, a solo album at that point. Um, no, I needed some time to kind of relax, lay on the beach, and drink the pina coladas, and enjoy myself for a while, think about what I was going to do next. Um, you know, whether I wanted to go soft, whether I wanted to go hard, or whatever I was going to do. And finally decided to do a pop rock album, and uh, with some R&B influence in it. And once I decided that was the direction, then it took me a while to write it and record it, and I took my time. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the great part of being a solo artist, that freedom to be able to take your time, you know, not, not have to arrange things for five guys. I was able to pack a suitcase and come and go as I pleased. It was nice. How long exactly did you take mulling it over with the pina coladas before you finally made it? I was mind? drunk by the time I decided <laughs> what I was going to do. Uh, that many pina coladas. It was that important. Um, let's see. Um, I guess it must have... Uh, I, maybe I'm almost a year of a lot of writing now. I have a studio in my house and I go down in the morning and I and I just wrote all... Whatever, don't think about what you're writing, just write. Ended up with these batch of songs. And uh, so I wrote for about a year. And then I spent two years recording. Mm-hmm. It's been a long time. Philadelphia? In Philadelphia. 
I mean, here you are in Nassau, and you go to Philadelphia. <laughs> you, gotta, you decide, no, I'm going to go to Philadelphia. <laughs> uh, great city, Philadelphia. It really is a great city. I love it there. Um, uh, W.C. Fields has given it a bad name, I guess. Yeah, it's Gravestone. I'd rather be here than in Philadelphia, or I spent a, a week one night in Philadelphia, or whatever the heck he said. But um, I like Philadelphia. The co-producer on the album, Lance Quinn, owns the studio in Philadelphia. It's called The Warehouse. And so that made it uh, a lot easier for me to come and go, you know, because normally if you have a group, you're going to a studio for six weeks. Okay, you, you block book it. Here you go, guys. It's yours for six weeks. Get it done. And I did it over two years. So, <clears throat> and I was there because that's where, you know, his studio was, the co-producer. How did you manage to hook up with him? Uh, he did the last April Wine album, The Walking Through Fire, that we mentioned before. And uh, I heard a Lita Ford song on MTV previous to that album so i'm going back about four years ago and it just jumped right out of the speakers and that particular song was nominated was nominated for a grammy for her uh he did lead ford also bon jovi and um i liked that song so much i said who did it i was looking for a producer and it turned out to be lance quinn he flew down to nasa we talked and then did the april wine thing got that out of the way and i wanted to use him on my solo album by the way how long have you been based in nasa Four years next month. Really? Yeah. Well, what made you decide to go down there, aside from the obvious? I guess maybe it is just the obvious reason. Yeah, yeah all the obvious reasons. Um, I was, uh, you know, see, April Wine had a real hard time at the end. You know, it was not pleasant. I would rather go to a dentist every day for the rest of my life than, than go through another six months of that. That's why I fell at the end of the time. Um, and I really had to get out of Montreal. I had to get out of Canada because it was so, we, you know, especially in Montreal, our hometown, you couldn't go anywhere without, oh, there's Miles from April Wine or there's Jerry from April Wine, you know. And I really had to get away from all of that, so I went down there. It's close to Miami, you know, planes come and go, Nassau, Miami, back and forth, all day long, every day of the week. I could go anywhere in the world from, you know, from Florida, so it was really close. I uh, love the sunshine, the palm trees. I always wanted to do that, you know. It was always my dream, and I could never do it, live somewhere like that and still be part of a group and a business with part four other partners. So. But you managed to... Uh uh, why, why did it had it gotten easier just because you know, you know being on your own less baggage uh, yeah that's it yeah yeah it was just me mm-hmm. my wife and my kids you know I have two yeah. children so do you ever miss the changing seasons or? none at all I, that there's hogwash to me people that say i i don't think i could do it i'd miss the changing of seasons hey right, come on if you could be down there you'd be down there believe me <laughs> who wants to see the changing of seasons that's that's for the birds get on a plane and go on a ski trip if they, you know if you miss the snow but uh that's my point of view, though. <laughs> Descending points of view well, should write in care of the station. <laughs> I'm sure there are lots out there that really love... And the, piece of, the reason people love, you know, the springtime is the bloody snow. You know, you got cabin fever, you're freezing, you're whatever off. Of course, how can you, you know, of course you'd like to change because the good things are going to happen. Well, I have good things there all the time. That's the way I look at it, anyway. By the way, how long have you been based in NASA? Four years next month. Really? Yeah. Well, what made you decide to go down there, aside from the obvious? I guess maybe it is just the obvious reason. Yeah, yeah all the obvious reasons. Um, I was, uh, you know, see, April Wine had a real hard time at the end. You know, it was not pleasant. I would rather go to a dentist every day for the rest of my life than, than go through another six months of that. That's why I fell at the end of the time. Um, and I really had to get out of Montreal. I had to get out of Canada because it was so, we, you know, especially in Montreal, our hometown, you couldn't go anywhere without, oh, there's Miles from April Wine or there's Jerry from April Wine, you know. And I really had to get away from all of that, so I went down there. It's close to Miami, you know, planes come and go, Nassau, Miami, back and forth all day long, every day of the week. I could go anywhere in the world from, you know, from Florida, so it was really close. Uh, I love the sunshine, the palm trees. I always wanted to do that, you know. It was always my dream, and I could never do it, live somewhere like that and still be part of a group and a business with part four other partners. So. But you managed to... Uh uh, why, why did it had it gotten easier just because you know, you know being on your own less baggage uh, yeah that's it yeah yeah it was just me mm-hmm. my wife and my kids you know I have two yeah. children so. do you ever miss the changing seasons or? none at all I, that there's hogwash to me people that say I I don't think I could do it I'd miss the changing of seasons hey come on if you could be down there you'd be down there believe me <laughs> who wants to see the changing of seasons that's that's for the birds get on a plane and go on a ski trip if they you know if you miss the snow but uh, that's my point of view, though. <laughs> Descending points of view well, should write in care of the station. <laughs> I'm sure there are lots out there that really love... And the, piece of, the reason people love, you know, the springtime is with the bloody snow. You know, you get cabin fever, you're freezing, you're whatever off. 
Of course, how can you, you know, of course you'd like to change because the good things are going to happen. Well, I have good things there all the time. That's the way I look at it, anyway. Talking about uh, about this album, it, uh, you did decide, as you were saying, you decided to go in a, in a pop rock vein. It's rock and roll. You've got some of the ballads on there, too. But, mm-hmm. uh, but it sounds like you went for a, a rock and roll album. But you didn't actually sit down and say, I'm going to make a, a tough-sounding album. Uh, I knew pretty much what I wanted. I wanted it to be um, very rhythmic. I was really interested in, you know, in, in making everything very rhythmic and, and very tight, and use all the uh, all the new stuff that's out there that I was listening to in April. What I would, you know, while in April one, hearing it on the radio, saying, "Gee, I wish I could do that," and never being able to do it, you know. And um, so, and Lance was very much into this. Uh, says, "Okay, Miles, this is this is it. Let's have fun with it, you know." Um, this is all the latest stuff. I didn't use a drummer with the exception of one track. It was uh, the drum machines and a lot of programming and, and programmers like John Caron who did all the Corey Hart stuff and people like that. And if you know what you're doing, it doesn't come off sounding real sterile or anything. It comes off sounding real good. And I had a ball doing it, you know. What about the band, uh, the, the, the people that you used? Were these people that you'd been wanting to, to work with? No, I met them through uh, Lance Quinn, mm-hmm. all these people, yeah. Uh, he would suggest somebody and, you know, and... Uh, Work with a lot of people, and finally, out of the group of people that I met, I picked five guys to be part of the band. And I asked them, "Would you like to come with me on the road?" And they all would like that very much. And they're waiting for the phone to ring right now. And what, what's the, the scoop with the tour uh, May? Points? Yeah, was right? tour in May. Yeah. And uh, is it going to be a, a tour of Canada first? You're going to Canada first, then down to the states and across the states. Mm-hmm. If all goes well. Yeah. What sort of states tour you're looking at? Maybe a, a club tour. You're going to try and. Uh... Uh, I don't know. Whatever, uh, whatever's out there. I mean, even in Canada, I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe in one city it'll be a club, in another city it'll be a, you know, a three thousand seat or somewhere else. It's going to be uh, more or less. I don't look forward to playing the clubs. I don't mind them under the right conditions. A showcase is fine with me. Uh, I don't mind playing small groups and small venues. Uh, the only offer that I've had, and we're not even looking for offers, was a phone call the other day to headline at uh, Ontario Place. And for a good deal of bucks, folks. So that's really nice. I'm really glad that somebody out there feels that I can still draw. Of course, that's not going to be uniform across the country. That's one example. I don't know what's going to happen. Did you put the guy on hold? You really? Uh, no, I said yes right there. Is that right? Oh yeah, I taped it too. I mean, I'll take him to court if he backs out. <laughs> Should, shouldn't be too eager. Put the guy on hold. Let him sweat for a moment. Uh, tell him we get Spielberg on the other. No, line. we told him we're thinking about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's we'll the, think about it. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Did you find a much difference working with a band? Now you got these guys together and asked them if they wanted to be a part of the band. Uh, it's a solo album; you can pick who you want. But was it really that? Mu- it wasn't that much different, really, from the last days of April Wine, was it? In what way? Well, I mean, in terms of the fact that uh, uh, the way I perceived it, anyway, towards the end, April Wine was Miles Goodwin, and whoever Miles Goodwin said was in April Wine. You mean on the very last album? That's all. Yeah, uh, but before that, not true. No, no, because the, well, there was a lot of uh, shifting, shifting lineup in the band. You were the one constant. In, in oh, I see what you mean. Okay, yeah. the band that broke up was together for ten years. Hmm. That's not too much shifting. No, no, that's true. Uh, for ten years, it was the five guys that were you know from 1978 till. Oh no, that's not ten years. What am I talking about? It'd be ten years today. From 1977, when Brian Greenway joined the band, we were that way until the end of April Wine. Before that, we were the band without Brian Greenway for X number of years. What we did was add. We didn't subtract. Mm -hmm. So for at least 10 years, we were four guys or five that were, you know, at the end. Uh, And when you talk about the end of April Wine, you're talking about, you're not talking about Walk Through Fire. You're talking about, you're... uh... No, April Wine broke up just previous to that. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, we broke up. We did a we did this this uh, this tour called One for the Road. It was the you know the last thing we had to do, and boy did we have fun. Whew, uh, that was the hardest thing I think I've ever done. But anyway, then for them too, we did not get along. We did not talk to each other, but we had to go on stage every night and play. It was very very difficult. Um, and it was over. That was it. Boom. The contract was done. I went back to Nassau. I get a phone call. Remember, Miles, we need one more album. So I said, okay. Called some guys. We did it. Boom. It was done. Mm-hmm. And that was the end of it. So the last the last April Wine album, aside, you did the live album from One for the Road, right? Yeah, that was the group on the road, the last tour. And then uh, before that was what, Animal Magic? Um, before that was Animal Grace, I Animal think. Animal Grace, I'm sorry. And maybe Power Play before that. Power Play, I remember, yeah. with Tell Me Why on it. Tell Me Why. Yeah. And a good song came off the Walking Through Fire album, too. The um, uh, What If We Fall In Love, mm-hmm. I think, was it? And there, there was Love Has Remembered Me. Love Has Remembered Me, yeah, that's the one, yeah. yeah. That was a good song. Yeah, we played that. Yeah. Played the heck out of it. Yeah, that's a real nice song. I like that song. So I wasn't holding back. It's impossible for me to sit down and write an album and not give a damn about if it's any good or not. 
Mm-hmm. And I said, to, and I had to write that that bloody thing, without the band to get everybody off my back. I'd still try my best. So. Was it just a, a general breakdown of, of relationships, or any specific things that led to the demise of the band? Um, it was basically two things. The main thing was I wanted out. And the other thing was that they wanted to change direction. If I was going to stay in it, they wanted to go very hard again. They wanted to go as hard as April Wine could get. They wanted that hard rock attack, leather jackets, you know, leather pants, long hair attack. And I wanted to go the other way. I wanted to go short hair. (laughs) Uh, I don't want the heavy metal influence. I want to wear a jacket. I don't want to wear leather, blah, blah, blah. And um, I wanted to get out. I wanted to do a solo album. So finally, we just couldn't agree on anything at any time, so... I said, you know, I'm out of here. And I'm, and in all fairness, I said, give me a dollar, you can have the name, and good luck with it. I don't want anything out of it. I own the name. It's yours. And run with it. Form your group. Do your hard rock stuff. But uh, that never happened for them either. That's yeah. interesting. Now, did did they consider it? Did they try to make a goal? I guess they considered and talk, um, talked amongst themselves. But the problem that they, they didn't do it was because there was no... Uh, I'm sorry to say there was no support without myself in it, you know. So... Um, that avenue, as it turned out, wasn't open to them, but I certainly made the offer available. It was uh, through negotiations later that it was obvious that uh, the backing wouldn't be there without me. I think to the, to the public, and certainly to the music industry, it's like the Guess Who without Burton Cummings. I mean... Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. yeah it doesn't, doesn't really... It's sound, it seems kind of bogus. I know, but there's been a lot of, um, a lot of uh, Guess Who's out there without him. Exactly. You know, which I guess maybe was an option, too. Yeah, but then again, you've seen what happened to them. Nobody really yeah. takes them too seriously. Yeah, right. Talk more about the the album. <laughs> Did you once think that Frank Sinatra could sing? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've never really been a fan. Um, although, um, I was going to tell you a joke. I will tell you the joke. It's a very short joke, but I, this guy is saying that Frank Sinatra once saved my life. These two hoods were beating me up in an alley, and Frank said, that's enough. da so he's a real nice guy, real kind-hearted guy. I don't know. Um, I guess he could sing. He's the original boss, you know. Um, the point of the whole song was just, a, you know, a statement on the way the social problems they, you know, caused by alcohol and drugs, cocaine, crack, uh, the AIDS, the problem with AIDS and everything. Just a little statement on, you know, these all these problems. And Sinatra's 70 or 70 plus, and he really can't sing anymore. And that's an end of an era, and it's all too bad. It's a pity. That's what I'm saying. It's a shame. Okay. Face the Storm seems to be kind of a personal statement from you about the past. Uh, am I right? Or no, it's about the present. Is that well, right? There's a bit of the past, yeah. A little bit of retrospect, yeah. Like uh, like a star that falls, what is it? And then fades away. Okay, anyway. I'll start again on it. Uh, yeah, Face the Storm is really about me getting back in the business. Yeah. And uh, the storm being the business and getting back on that horse and... Uh, and uh, and from the, some of the lyrics, it's stating how I've been feeling, you know, the apprehension, the anxiety that goes with the decision, and then getting back in the commitment to go for it. And that's what the song's about. Yeah, I've always loved that Lee Michaels song, too. Uh-huh. I didn't, you know, I uh, yeah, you know, that, uh, I just heard it one day, well, you know, in that two and a half, three year period looking for material and recording, I heard it one day on the radio and said, boy, that's still a really good song. Yeah. It is a very simple, straight ahead, but catchy song with a great feel. And I was really trying to get feel on the album and decided to demo it and it sounded so good, did it for real and put it on the record. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't, I almost never hear that one anymore, but I used to love it. I used to really love that song. Sonia, who, who is uh, Jeff Paris? Jeff Paris is a Philadelphia songwriter, singer-songwriter. Mm-hmm. I, he's out now at Los Angeles now. A heck of a singer, great singer, great songwriter too, super, super. I don't know why he hasn't broken yet, but he's just amazing. And he had the song, it was called My Girl. And I remember the original My Girl, so I got I asked him if I could change the names, and so we went from My Girl to Sonia. Mm-hmm. It's a ballad, you know, done Miles Goodwin style. I really like the song; it's a nice song. Another ballad that we're playing already is uh, "Are You Still Loving Me." There's a uh, got your trademark all over it. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. it does. Yeah, yeah. I was um, I like that song too. I was concerned it might be a little too adult in some respects, you know, because it's. Uh, but it depends on the interpretation. I like the song a lot. I think it's a real good song. No, what sort of? You mean in a lyrical sense? Yeah, in a lyrical sense. Yeah. yeah. You figure it's it's not a song that, that teenagers are going to really relate to if they really listen. I don't know. I, I'm I'm really not, I'm not really sure on that. It seems uh, a little more mature than than a "You Won't Dance with Me" or something like that. You know. Yeah. That, that, but that uh, it always struck me. You, know, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but when when you did something like uh, "You Won't Dance with Me," it's a little bit of tongue in cheek there, wasn't there? I mean, that was that was almost like a a, a tribute. It was such a, 
uh, uh, teen two straws in the in the soda anthem. You know, yeah, was, right, exactly. Well, no, I was very serious about it because you have to remember when I wrote it, I was only 17 years old playing in a high school band back in Nova Scotia. Really? Yeah. And just dug it out and said, hey, that's, that's kind of cute. And, and did it the same way it was written as an Everly Brothers takeoff. So by the time you did mm. it, it was maybe a bit of a tribute, but when you yes. wrote it... Yes, was... I was serious about it. Yeah, you, mm. you won't dance with me. It's really a drag. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I remember that one real well. That was the first radio job I had. They used to call for that one all the time. Have you got a U.S. release? Is that important to you on this one? Or? Yeah, yeah. It just came out on Atlantic Records in the mm. States, W.A. in, uh, in uh, you know, over there, across mm -hmm. the water. <laughs> Are they going to market you as a, like a, a new face, do you think? Oh, I think they have to. Mm -hmm. I think they have to take this uh, this battle scar, old puss of mine, and market it as a new face. Um, no, actually, I've held up pretty good. But uh, <laughs> let me. Just, okay, I heard your question. Let me answer it. Yes, uh, they're going to market me as a brand new artist. Uh, April Wine had success, but Miles Goodwin doesn't mean as much there as it does here. Um, um, I was signed by the president of uh, the company, Doug Morris. So that's a pretty good commitment. When the president signed you, he got the tape on a Friday. He signed me on a Monday. Uh, he listened to it on the weekend and said it's a deal. And um, so I was very happy and very fortunate. You know, to do that in the States is really something. A lot of people have a very difficult time, and I was lucky. He, he likes the album very much. He called it a classic, in his words. I don't know if he says that to everybody or signs everybody and he meets on a Friday afternoon or whatever, but... It's. It, it must be nice to know that 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 you got signed for the album, right? Yeah. On the strength of that, right there. Yeah, and mm. not and not because of uh, you know. Well, somebody. I think the April one had some influence. Obviously, you know, we really must realize that. Yeah, there's. They sold a few million records down here. Somebody's got to know the voice and everything. Yeah, that must have been. Uh, was that gratifying? Did it Did it hurt the band uh, when? Man, you've been you've been making records that people remember. I mean, when people found out you were coming into the radio station, everybody's got their favorite. You know, mm -hmm. everybody starts talking about this, that, and the other April Wine song. And you had so many of those out before you ever got to uh, the big breakthrough in the U.S. Uh, was that was that the one of the sweetest points of the the career, or did it turn out to be a, a detriment? And the, did it cause more tension in the band? When no, you... no, no, we had a ball during those periods. See, when Brian Greenway joined in 1977. Uh, we made an album called First Glance. We decided to toughen up, uh, refocus, and all that kind of stuff. That's why we called it First Glance. We had a brand new record deal on uh, Capitol Records, our first record for Capitol. And we had a song called Roller that broke us down there. All of a sudden, that following year, 12-month period, we were traveling a lot in the States, opening up for a lot of big-name people, like Journey and Foreigner and all kinds of various people. And then uh, we went to England and recorded uh, The Nature of the Beast, and uh, Just Between You and Me broke in the States, top 40. And that record ended up selling a couple of million records. And at that point, we were able to tour as headliners all across the States, back and forth a couple of times, across Canada a couple of times, over to Europe a couple of times. We did a lot of touring from that album. And those were real, those were a couple of very, you know, two or three sweet years. You know, we were finally out of Canada, being accepted as, a, as an international act, seeing the world. And um, it was very sweet. It was great. It was great. Now, and it continued for a while, and it started to fall off until until the um, demise of the group. But when I look back at the whole thing, and I think about the best part of April Wine, that wasn't the best part for me at all. The best part was about 75, 76. Really? Yeah, it was stand back, right in and around there. That's what I considered the the real fun part of April Wine, because it was so young. We were all so young and so innocent, and we went in and uh, just did what we wanted, um, recorded we produced ourselves for the first time, had a ball, a lot of great songs on that Stand Back album. First album to ever go platinum in this country, and I went double platinum, five or six Juno award, uh, nominations that year, etc. And we were kids, we were kids, we were just having a ball, just, um, it was sensational. And later on, when, when we when we had all that excess, it was fun, but it was in a different way, we were more mature, and all oh, it's about time, and... and uh, if you were a kid around that time, I mean, uh, the band started a lot before that, too, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, you must have... Uh, how old were you when the band actually started? 32. <laughs> 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 no, how old was I? Jeez, I don't know how old I was. Let me think. I'll tell you, I'm 39 now. Mm -hmm. so, so you have to trace it back. Figure it out, folks. Yeah, I'm 39 years old now. Yeah. Uh, 
that, uh, as long as we're on the topic. You know, I'm, it's funny, sometimes you hear stories, and you can't remember where you hear them, and it's finally, it's nice to get a chance to check them out. I remember hearing a story, which I never heard anything else about, about you guys having a single out in the U.S. that suddenly got lots of airplay, and you didn't even know it. Right. Bad side of the moon. No, you could have been a lady. Could have been a lady. Okay, so I yeah. heard the story wrong. Yeah, you could have been a lady. It was a big, big hit. I mean, at the end of the whole year, they got the top 100 for the entire year. We were up around number 23 out of the entire year. So it was a big record, but we didn't know about it. We were playing little dives all over northern Quebec. Mm -hmm. And uh, the management, I still haven't forgiven them, I didn't know what to do. That They were new in the business, and we were watching the charts, and, next, you know, and nothing ever happened. We didn't go down and work it. Next thing you know, it was gone. And we found out about it, and we, you know, we tried to break up, and you know, they're bringing the manager and all this, you know, for this club in northern Quebec somewhere, saying you guys got to hang together. You did it once. Sorry about this, that, and the other thing. It was weird, but we missed the boat on that one. We missed the boat. That's unbelievable now to sit here and, and say, how could you not know, and why didn't they do something about it? You had to be in Canada in 1971, I think, to really know what was going on. And there was nothing going on up here uh, to speak of. It was bizarre, but that really did happen. Yeah. Do you remember when the, when the band actually formed? Do you remember what year? 1969. 69. In in Montreal? late 69. It was really 1970. It was somewhere. I think it was December 69. Yeah. And and that was in Montreal. Huh? In in Halifax, Nova Scotia. In Halifax, and then you went to. We Montreal? went to Montreal April 1st, 1970. Yeah. You remember that? Eh? Yeah. April yeah. 1, April 1st. A lot of things happened on April 1st. Was that where the name came the from? Career. No, no, just no. Just happened to be April 1st uh -huh. that we left on that yeah. date. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, you made your, your first album came out when? In 70. 70. Yeah. yeah, it was called April Wine. It was with the three Henman brothers and myself. Yeah. And the song that came off that was Fast Train. It was yeah. called Fast Train. How long did, did that line up stay together? Uh, until the next album. <laughs> and, uh, the bass player singer wanted to decide to go back to college. So he picked up and left on us. And he was replaced by Jimmy Clinch. Now that's a guy, a, a, a friend of mine who's a big fan of, of yours, uh, told me to ask you about Clinch. He said he, he thought that, uh, that Clinch's direction might have been different from yours. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. He wrote some great April, April Wine songs, uh, a couple of classics, Who Would a Night being one of them, certainly. He sang Weeping Widow. He wrote Weeping Widow, I think, a great song. Um, and a couple of other songs that you know maybe we don't know it unless you have the album really know the album but all of them great songs mm -hmm. and he was a great singer different so totally different from me he was a real screamer a very mid-range voice which was great he went on to with bto for a while right. and boy i'm sorry that didn't work out for him but anyway um yeah we had a lot of uh, we had some conflict of interest you know and uh and we were both young and um uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. I mean, I really still feel bad about it. We've spoken about it before, Jimmy and I, but then all all as well. But uh, there was, didn't seem to be room for the two of us at that point. It's so dumb to think about it now. Yeah. But he went on, and I I remained. Uh, the same guy who told me to ask you about about uh, Mr. Clench asked me to ask you, why are you wearing sunglasses in your new video? Why not? <laughs> I guess that's what I thought. <laughs> why should I ask him that? I don't know. Just ask. Why him. not? <laughs> Why not? Because, let me see, because he's so drugged out, folks, that exactly. it's unbelievable. Yeah. You wouldn't want to see this guy without his glasses right. on. It's scary. Now that I'm sat at a table <laughs> with Miles Goodwin, I can see that it's time that he hung up his cleat. <laughs> but anyway, I've been doing national television here without them, so there you go. There you are. Yeah, yeah. Have you got to, you like doing the videos now? I enjoyed doing this one because I had a lot of input into it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you... you Certainly, uh, you know, from the days when, uh, you know, when you started out, it was something that you never never really conceived of, I guess, you know? And I mean, I imagine there are some people who, who will never really take to it, will never yeah. really get to enjoy it. Well, I don't mind it. It's it's ironic because I got to meet uh, Robert Palmer, who lives in the Bahamas, and, and, you know, when we discussed uh, this one day, and we were talking about it, and he said he hated doing videos. He'd never been satisfied with one and didn't enjoy doing them. And I said, well, I haven't had a great experience either. And then he came out and did... Uh, Addicted that, to love. Addicted to love with that classic video. Yeah. You know, so bang, bingo, right on the nose. There you go. Yeah. Can't argue with it. Have you got any plans for the next album yet, or are you just going to... Uh, no, I have plans for the next album. Matter of fact, the next one's done already. I'm working on the one with the following one, but I, you know, I don't want to talk too much about it, because we're, we're doing this one now. <laughs> I write a lot of songs. I find it not very difficult to write. Difficult to make me write a great song, but I can write lots of songs. Uh, the next album is totally, totally different. Completely different. And, um, but that's another story. That'll, that'll be out one of these days. Yeah. Uh, do you prefer, uh, you, you write alone? 
you collaborate? I mix it up, yeah. Yeah. Do you, which do you prefer? Any? You know, do no, it like? doesn't matter. I don't mind any any which way at all. Yeah. However it turns out, I don't mind. Like the, the song's the thing, not the writer. Yeah. If you want to know more about Steve Burgess, he's about to release his new book. And we'll have links for you in the description. A lot more interviews from Steve Bridges coming up. Ian Thomas is the next one. If you want to make a donation to the channel, there are links to PayPal at the very top. You can join our Patreon, get early access to all our videos. But subscribe to our channel, share our videos, comment on them, and like them. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Canada.